screen. It's recording right now, it records my voice. So the nice thing is, today my job is to basically problematize this, talk about some tools, talk about what you could and should do in your classroom, talk about what you could and should do personally in, in terms of technology use. Your job is to sit back, relax, be reflective, uh, problematize what I'm talking about, um, push back a little bit, but please understand that the, the PowerPoint is there for you, the Google Doc is there, the back channel, but also we're recording this. So you, if, for those of you that are cord cutters, you can go home and watch this later, bring all the kids together and watch this, this boring guy lecture. Um, the same lame jokes will still be on the video, so you won't miss out. So let's get started. What we're gonna talk about, like I said earlier, we're, this is an open, it should be, it should be an open uh, environment, but we're talking about networked, collaborative learning. The opportunities that exist as we move from face-to-face -to, -face to online interactions. A um, Couple different things. There's uh, one version of my avatar. The origin of my avatar is that when I was teaching eighth grade, I was voted uh, least photogenic for about six years running in my classroom with my kids. Um, so one day I said, forget this to my ELA students. I said, let's make an avatar for Mr. O'Byrne. So I had one student, um, actually a kid that I'll be writing about in uh, upcoming issue of JAL, a little bit about him. Uh, he basically put together the avatar that looked the least creepy. And that's very, very hard to do. So he put together an avatar for me and I've been using it ever since. Um, when I do workshops and, and um, publications, I beg the publishers to let me use the avatar because I think that's more me than this. Uh, my website's up on the top, wiburn.com. Everything I do, I post up openly on there. Uh, so the materials for today are already there. They were there first thing this morning. Uh, in the future, if I give other talks, they're there. If I teach classes, they're there. Uh, everything I do is on the blog because I think that if it's of use to some teacher anywhere, they should have an opportunity to use it. We'll talk a little bit about that. There's my email address, so uh, after the fact, if you have some hate mail, that's exactly where you can send it to. I'm on Google+, I'm on Twitter, I'm also on Facebook. There's more pictures of me and my son and, and my family on Facebook, and it's not really as much uh, elsewhere. And that's why I'm heading home. I got a four-year-old birthday party at some trampoline park to uh, <laughs> run when this thing is done. Uh, I'm an educational technologist by trade, and we'll talk a little about, a bit about the Instructional Tech Digital Media Lit program that I run. And it's uh, a program for veteran teachers in Connecticut, right now just Connecticut, to make them experts in the use of technology. So this is the information about the back channel that you already had. The QR code is there, the tiny, the, the URL <coughs> shortener. But basically the way that this will operate is most of the information will be on the Google Presenter. The back channel is there for you to go in and ask questions. Uh, and have a little bit of dialogue, I'll try to remember to stop and go back to the back channel. The blog is there, digitally literate, that's wioburn.com where I put everything. And then this will be a fun mix of hybrid learning spaces. So for those of you that uh, are here today, I'm here today too, okay? I'm here in person tomorrow, tonight, I drive home, First thing in the morning, we'll have another session using a Google Hangout on air. Um, so it's a way for us to try and really play with the, the medium and see what we can do with it. Um, but as you'll see, I use a lot of these tools every day. And I also have but this one here, all oh, these technologies overrated. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so if you click on that back channel document link, that's probably the best way to get to it. And I apologize about that. No, bad coffee in the hotel room. So one of the things I put at the beginning of my talks when I teach class, one of the things I put uh, at the beginning of lectures is I put a little tweetable summary. It's a good way for us to keep succinct 
what we're going to talk about. Uh, there are times that I'll ramble on, and I want to focus myself, but also focus my students, and know where we're headed. So I, I often have my students do this as well. They'll present a project and they'll tweet out, you know, 140 characters. What was the theme of, you know, identity in Moby Dick? Uh, so it's really hard to basically narrow it down. We're going to talk about literacy and technology and how they're changing work process and product, and we need to focus more on work process. Um, and the other challenge is that we need to figure out how to do this while const uh, technology is constantly changing, but also we're trying to figure out our relationship to all of this. So we're preparing our students for their futures. I mean, that's one of the, when I taught, if I could boil all the other hats that I wore, at, at, at the most minimal part, I was trying to prepare my kids for the world they're gonna grow up in. And that's at the most I could boil it down. I still view that as being my main job, is working as a university uh, professor. So the challenge is, with, with technology, that's all well and good, but who worries about how we use technology? You know, if I'm a teacher and I wanna use technology in my classroom, who, who helps me? I, I'm, as the teacher, I'm supposed to help my students out, but who's helping the teacher? So that's one of the challenges that drives me and drives my work. And also, we don't know what this future ultimately will look like. We have absolutely no idea. Uh, there's a recent Pew Internet in America report that came out talking about the future of tech use societally, and the only thing we can agree upon is the fact that we don't agree. We have no idea what the future's gonna look like. Um, we're starting to see wearable technology come in. You know, we have Google Glass, and. You know, you have the Android watches coming out, and then the iWatch is going to come out, and so you, you know, you can take pictures with your your watch, or you can make calls with your watch, or your students can record you yelling at another kid with their watch. So all of this is coming, and everybody's like, "What? I hate this guy!" Right? Uh, but this is coming, and we don't know what to do with all this, and we don't know what the next step is. You know, Google has already patented uh, contact lenses that will check for like glucose levels in your bloodstream, you know? So we're gonna see these different permutations of technology pick up pace. And so what we wanna do is think about, well, what does this mean for us, but also what does this mean for uh, our students? And on a broader scale, what does this mean for the individual and the collective? As an organization, we have to figure out how we deal with technology. So, how many people, this is what your desk looks like? <laughs> this is how we work? You know, I mean, it's the file folders. Is it this neat? Who has it? But it's much, much messier. You know, the file folders, and you have all the documents there. You have the little calculator. How many people still own, like, a, like a little digital camera? Yeah. Or use it. Yeah, I know. How many people just switched over to the cell phone already? Yeah. That's interesting to see. So, I mean, this is how most of us work. We still work. You know, I mean, this is, you, you see the keyboard sliding in a little bit. How many, I mean, this is, for those of you that said that you had the messy desk, is this messy enough for you? A little bit messier? Some days. You know, for most of us, this is how we operate. Then we started to fold that computer into the classroom. We started to fold that into what we do. How many people, your desktop of your computer is like every document that you've ever owned? <laughs> you are the bane of my, like, how many do you have on your computer screen right now? You're on Facebook right now? No, I mean, it's, you, know, you have people that have documents everywhere. And then you go and you say, well, where is that? You know, I have a colleague that it's like, all right, we're looking for the one workshop for reading adolescent lit tonight. And it's like, well, hold on, here's my process. I go into Microsoft Word, and from Word, I go to here, and it's here, and here, and here, and I'm like, oh my. Like it, so that is really nice and neat. But how much of a transition was it for us to get from those earlier pictures of, of our work process to this? You know, how many challenges do we have just to fold that computer in? And now it seems sort of odd if we see a classroom or a desk that doesn't have it. 
What else do we bring? What else do we use as a tool? What other text and tools do we use? This is uh, a bag. This is a colleague of mine. She teaches children's lit. She probably internalizes the changes that are occurring to literacy and technology more than anybody else I know. And I studied with some big people that really think about this, but look at what she carries around daily. She came into my office and I said, dump your bag out now. I want to take a picture. <laughs> so I took a picture. So you see uh, Devere and Dana Grisham's book. You see the Atlantic. Uh, you see her iPad, because I wrote a grant to get the department iPads. She's got a big Kindle, because she doesn't want to bring the iPad on the beach. Okay. She's got a little PDA Palm Pilot. You see that thing up there? She has that because she is afraid, and the track phone. She doesn't have like an iPhone or anything. She has the track phone and the PDA because she's afraid that they'll have too much information and data on her. Okay, so she has that because she doesn't want people to know like all the info about her. I'm like, do you know what the Amazon Kindle and the iPad are already? <laughs> but never mind. So the challenge with this is we individually, personally, are trying to figure out how do we adapt to these technologies, but we're supposed to lead children. How many people here are trying to figure out if you can finally like get a Kindle or switch over to PDFs and e-readers and e-pubs? How many people here need to smell a book, see a book, and hold a book? You know? You're trying to figure out, can I make that, can I switch, can I pivot, can I move over? So on the back channel, one of the first questions is, what do we use? We use s'mores. Who's got s'more? We have Google Docs, Google Drive. How many Google Apps for educators people are here? How many people use Google Docs and Google Apps and Google Forms and Google Spreadsheets? Google Forms is one of the greatest things on the face of the planet. Uh, but we have iPads, Words Their Way, Google Suite, Google Forms, like I said, rocks. Post-it notes. <laughs> Google Hangouts. What else? What other texts do we use? What other uh, tools do we use? I mean, text could be broadly. In my world, text is very broad. It could be an online site, it could be an online resource. Text could be, you know, we're surrounded by text in the back of the room. Any other word, any other text or books that we use and love? Evernote, oh my God, Evernote is, I, I have a, I, at some point I'm gonna go to like Evernote addiction uh, <laughs> club. It's a little disturbing how much I use Evernote. Um, but there's different things that we can use, things that make our life feel a little bit more sane. Weebly. And the cool thing about this is that no matter how many times I go and do a talk about different tools that we can use, there's always new tools out there. What about some of your voices? What else do you use? What's something that you use pretty regularly that you love that you can't, can't run your classroom without? Yeah. One note. And now that they have the new surfaces out, that's like the one note tool. What else? What else do we use? Pinterest. What is it? Pinterest. Pinterest. Oh, how many people are Pinterest, Pinterest fans here? I am, that's one of the things I'm going to have in the upcoming JAL uh, column is that I want us to move our students and also move ourselves from content consumers to content curators to content constructors. I want us to create online content. I think the curation part is hugely important because I am trying to make an argument that those of you that use uh, Learnist and Pinterest, you are doing good to the, the internet, okay? You are, as, a, as an informed observer, you are identifying what's quality and what's garbage online. It might be Pinterest, you know, or Learnist, you're looking at, you know, great reading strategies or great writing strategies handbooks. You might also be developing pins for fine Italian handbags. Who am I to judge? Uh, but there is value in curation. And we need to teach our kids how to curate online content. We need to teach them how to go through and evaluate. 
Let's see what else we have. Google Suite, Smart Boards, Promethean Boards, Tumblr. Tumblr is a great blog. A lot of my students are using it. Um, so let's shift gears a little bit. Collaboration. You know, for most of us, collaboration, it, I have department meetings every two weeks. How many people here love <laughs> You have those meetings and you sit there face to face. And the challenge is a lot of people now, a lot of organizations are starting to say there are no computers, laptops, mobile phones allowed at a meeting because you're not paying attention. Anybody living in that world yet or fighting that battle yet? Yeah, there's already four or five hands. There's a lot of organizations that are saying now to have a really good meeting, no computers. Everybody sit there and stare at each other, okay? So how do we collaborate in face-to-face -face environments? How do we collaborate using the computer? You know, bringing in a computer into the room and now we're interacting with this other, with this other device. You know, what do we do with the computer? Do we bring in people from outside? And then most of what I do and most of what my students do um, is we use the internet as a tool to collaborate online. So I joined Google Hangouts on Air. Um, actually, I'm doing research with a couple people. Uh, one's actually University of Delaware. Um, but basically what we're looking at is how can we use open tools to create personal learning networks? So about five or six of us that are going on a Google Hangout on Air. Um, and actually, I think it's tomorrow. No, it's today at about 3, 30, 4 o'clock. So when I leave here, I'm gonna, while I'm driving, Illegally, I'm going to be on a Google Hangout on Air talking about Hangouts on Air, uh, about open learning and about personal learning networks. So you can watch me as I get pulled over. Uh, but that's the challenge is how do we collaborate, collaborate uh, virtually? How do we open up our classroom, open up uh, our own computer and work with other people? Here's the question though, what do we lose? What do we lose when we move online and we don't have that face-to-face -face collaboration? We lose interaction. What else? Reading. Facial expressions, tones, reading the other person. What else? Sometimes words that are warmly written could be cold and red. Yeah. That was beautiful. Yeah, can you please write that down? Somebody write that down in the Google Doc. I don't want to lose that. Sometimes things go ahead. I mean, think about how many times we misinterpret tone in email, you know? That's one of the things, that I started to use emoticons in my emails. Now I think I can't stop. Um, and, and I've had dialogue, like, is it appropriate for a professor to use an emoticon? For those of you that have no idea, like the little smiley sideways thing. And I mean, how many people have teenage children? You know what emoticons are? Okay, I have a four-year-old. He doesn't do emoticons yet. But I, I do emoticons and emails and blog posts, and I don't know if it's appropriate or not. But that's the, you know, what do we lose when we move from face-to-face -to, -face to online meetings? When we, you know, what's missing? There's that interpersonal, the intrapersonal piece. Um, I've done a little research on it. A lot of my students, nice emoticon. Uh, some of my students, they said that part of the challenge was I thought students that wouldn't speak freely in a classroom face-to-face -face might go online. And it was weird, some of the students liked the ability to go online and video conference and chat because there's almost, because of the technology, there's, it's called latency, there's a little delay. So it made students sort of pause and think about what they wanted to say before jumping in. And as an educator and as an educational psychologist, that's a good thing for me they actually think before they open their mouths. Um, but the challenge also is because of the tool, because of the medium, it was hard for them to jump in to the discussion. They sort of, it was much easier for them to take a back seat. One of the other cool things is that six year program that I talked about, the Instructional Tech Digital Media Lit program. Um, during the summer, we have a couple face-to-face -face classes. During the trimesters, it's totally online. A lot of the teachers complain, okay? 
the classes were all online. I said, you can use your own time. You can basically do your work whenever you want. We have complaints. So now we have to offer face-to-face -face classes because they wanted to come back together. They wanted the opportunity, even if it's like three hours every month, month and a half, they wanted to come back together. They appreciate the online part and the, uh, the control of their time, but they, want, they didn't want to lose the face-to-face -face part. So we're a program that's cutting edge, bleeding edge, trying to use the internet and these technologies and there's a balance that has to occur, or we try to figure it out. So what's causing all of this? This is a lot of the research that came out of uh, UConn, where I was a doc student. It's also research I continue to do. Uh, there's a couple different things that are, that are spurring this. One of them is that we have to deal with the, the didactic, ambiguous nature of text. Uh, basically. My advisor, Don Liu, talked about literature uh, as, as literacy as dyxis. It, 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 everything's changing, okay? Everything is a, in a constant state of change. So all the technologies that we use will continue to change. So we can sit here and spend a lot of time figuring out what tools we want to use, and tomorrow will be a better one. Uh, also, Doug Belshaw talks about how uh, text and liter literacy is ambiguous. It means that we have to have some wiggle room. So those of us, we talked about it earlier, you know, even now, think about if, if we look at text or we look at writing, we, we could talk about writing as being very broad. So for example, um, is it considered writing when you have a student write a five paragraph essay? Probably. Is it considered writing when we have a student write a tweet? 140 characters. Probably. Is it considered writing if you have students create uh, a digital storytelling piece or create a movie. That's where we start to have some disagreement. But there is like an ambiguous nature. There's a little bit of wiggle room involved in what we're talking about here. The other big challenge that we have to adjust to is what Bakhtin identified as chronotopes. This is changing time and space. So if we think earlier about collaboration, this is probably the hardest piece that people will have to adjust to. It's like, okay, well, we're gonna have a meeting. We all have to be here at the same time, in the same place. But with technology, a lot of times, you don't have to, okay? For example, this talk right now, we're all here. Tomorrow, I won't be here. This talk right now, some people are not here. There's a video out there that they can review, okay? People can video conference in and see. Also, this talk right now, we have uh, people that tuned in earlier on Twitter to see what we're talking about. So with chronotopes, things are, ch are, are constantly changing. These understandings about time and space should also change as well. And the last big thing that's changing is collaboration. We all have something to add. We all have something to share. Okay, and when we come to meetings like this, sometimes we lose that. There, you won't have a chance to share your input, uh, input or share your voice. But if we use the right tools and we select the proper tools and the proper digital text, there's an opportunity to build in a space so that you can collaborate and you can share. So what's this look like? I'm big on dispositions. Uh, I think most of my research is in dispositions. I think that the, the real key to bringing technology in the classroom is individual teacher dispositions. Tomorrow morning, my little uh, spiel is gonna be about the digital natives debate and how it's hogwash, okay? I, I think that there's this mindset that the younger kids get it. You know, the younger teachers, they know technology and us older teachers don't. It's baloney. Okay, or they believe there's like a gender lens to it, not true. I think it comes down to individual teacher dispositions. I think it's a general willingness, or it's a desire. I think there's a lot of flexibility at stake. I think there's uh, like a persistent thinker status. There's also a critical thinker. It's being able to look at a text or a tool and figuring out, okay, what does this mean for me? What does it mean for my students? What does it mean in my content area? Would this actually work? So Intel, two years ago, put together a study, the future of knowledge work. 
And we're right in the middle of all this. Not only are we stuck there, but our students are gonna have to go into this environment, and most importantly, uh, this organization. That's why we're here, that's why I'm here. We gotta figure out how do we prepare for this. So this is what it looks like. A couple different things. Number one, flexibility is a requirement. Our kids need to, we need to be flexible thinkers. We need to be flexible, we need to be able to adapt, we need to be able to uh, transition, we need to be able to, uh, as Eric was setting up Socratic earlier, Socratic, it was like, well, it might not work. You know, I mean, it's, a lot of this stuff may or may not work, you gotta be flexible, we have to adapt. We have to work dynamically in different teams. We have to be able to pivot. How many, when we were doing Socrative earlier, how many different team structures could you have identified yourselves as being a part of? You know, you all have different leadership roles. Within this organization, you also have leadership roles out of here, back at your school. You have leadership roles in your community. And you have to be able to flexibly, and uh, you need to dynamically pivot to help do the job at hand. And this is the environment that our students are gonna go into, and you know, those are all individual levels at an organizational level. How do you prepare yourself for that? This is one of the tough ones. Number one, office location can be anywhere, okay? How many people uh, commute, I mean, uh, work from home? How many people will work from home on a tablet or a laptop? You know, you take calls from your home and you're in your PJs or something else. Um, but basically, you, your office can be anywhere, you know, any place. I mean, I had a video conference with you. Where were you? Bahamas or Cuba? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So we're working on a chapter, she's in the Bahamas, and I'm like, why are you answering this email? Like, literally. Why are you answering this email? You should not even know that I'm sending this to you. She was on work though, it was work. Yeah. She was just research work. Um, so that's the part is that this office location could be anywhere. The other issue is the human condition. That's what we're losing, you know? That's what we're losing. The, the ability to separate yourself from work. So yeah, this stuff is all great. You know, I love the fact that I have emails all the time. But last night, when my email was blowing up, how many emails do I have already? Look, I got nine emails and like 10 tweets I gotta answer. Most of it's garbage, except for people in here. I love all <laughs> But then, you know, where is, the, where is the time to separate myself? And I'm that person that when I work with a colleague and they're like, I don't answer emails after five o'clock and I don't answer them on the weekend. I'm like, weirdo, what is that? <laughs> what? How many people have that rule? Yeah, God bless you. Are you guys answering? Yeah. I mean, there are people that do that, and I'm like, I wish I could do that. My challenge now is I got a four-year-old, okay? And I'm really, really concerned about the, the love affair that he sees daddy has with this thing, and my wife has with this thing, okay? I'm really, really worried about the fact that, yeah, it's cool that I had a Google Hangout in air this morning with my son as he woke up, woke up, <laughs> um, let me get more coffee. But I'm also concerned about now there's this intermediary between my son and, and me, and it's this device. I mean, so we have the opportunity to have our office be anywhere, but we're losing the human condition, and that's problematic. Okay? So as much as we talk about how great these tools could be, we need to consider what we're losing. Electronic teammates, who's afraid of bees? Anybody? My wife is definitely afraid of bees, so as I was doing this, I was like, she would not want to be in this audience. Electronic teammates, this is what Clay Shirky's been talking about for years, this is what fuels Wikipedia, this is what you need to and should bring to this organization. The opportunity to, we talked about the dynamic team structures earlier and the flexible groupings, but when there is an issue or a challenge or work, how do we use digital tools to swarm in and get the job done, okay? This is the hive mind mentality. 
Okay, this is what fuels search engines. This is what fuels Wikipedia, like I said. This is a skill that our students will need and we gotta figure out how to build it into our classroom, but also organizationally, how do we thoughtfully use these tools to swarm together to solve problems? This is part of that knowledge work survey. Last but not least, personal data agents make your life easier. But, so what they mean by this is there's a lot of little uh, personal data units that are starting up. How many people have heard of Uber or Lyft? Yeah, in the back. All the techies are in the back of the room. <laughs> yeah, Uber or Lyft is now I can pull out a cell phone, I can have a car come pick me up. You know, you have, what we're starting to see now is this like niche culture online where groups will get together and they'll either make apps that make your life easier or they'll do services to make your life easier, okay? Because there's too much data for you personally to deal with. There's too much for you to do in your own everyday life. You need somebody else to, to do it. Case in point, Evernote. How many people raise their hand for Evernote? One note's the same thing. I know people that Evernote, it's either like, yeah, I use it, or they're like, yeah. Uh, Evernote, one note. Uh, Pinterest to a certain extent, but also uh, Google Keep does it. For those of you that use Chromebooks and Google Apps, Evernote for me and all these apps, what they do is, and I've blogged about it, is my, it's my online multimodal brain. So what, I read a lot. I read a lot online. If I see things that I think are interesting or something I want to think about later, I don't have the mental capacity to think, to even say to myself, I want to think about this later. I save it to Evernote. If I see a website that looks interesting to me, how many of you bookmark a website and then on your browser you have like 500 bookmarks? <laughs> yeah, and you're like, someday I'm going to read that. So I just save everything to Evernote. And now I know that whatever I bookmark or save or that note or whatever, it's in Evernote. So for example, I just, we just joined a farmer's co-op. Okay, so now we have a lot of different venues that I've never seen in my life that I have to do something with because I'm not letting anything rot. So we had an influx of bok choy in our house. Okay, how many people are in co-ops and do a lot of cooking? Nobody? Heathens. Um, so I had all this bok choy and I'm trying to figure out what do I do with all this. In my Evernote now, I could show you, I got like 10 different recipes for kimchi. So I, I basically sat there one day and I'm like, oh, that looks good. Save, 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 save. And then like two weeks later when my bok choy came in, I sat there in my, in my kitchen with my iPhone or uh, with my iPad and I'm like, uh, this one looks the best, put it up on it, started making my kimchi. And I knew the recipe was in Evernote. Didn't have to worry about it. Didn't have to go back online and search, I just saved it. So these provide opportunities to make our life a little bit more simple, but we're also unearthing new problems. One is your data and your identity, which we'll talk a little bit about later, but also these are new jobs that your kids might wanna have. So when we talk about all of those different dispositions, it's like this impossible next step. What are, your all, what are you currently doing? How are you preparing yourself or your students or how could you prepare yourself or your students for this future. I love that quote from before. Where did it go? Sometimes words that are warm. Oh man, that's, I got a blog post coming on that. So go back to the back channel. How do you prepare yourself? How do you prepare, like you should be figuring out how to have your students use these tools, but you need to prepare. How do you prepare yourself? Anything that you can do other than just experiment with tools and model behaviors. How do we get into this? Use it. That's the, we talked a little bit about this at lunch, but that's one of the biggest things here, is you have to just use it. And also, you have to play. I mean, those of you that, that are, are elementary school teachers, those of you that are in pre-K through three, 
actually all of us in this room should, should agree that play is a fundamental part of learning. Okay? We need to play. We need to play with these tools. We, you need time to sit down with Google Sites or Google Forms or Evernote or Vine and figure out what is this? What is this tool? What use does it have for me? And then when you're done with Vine, you say, I will never use this again in my life. This is horrible. Or you think it's great and you want to use it again, but you need to play. Seek others who use tech. How important is that interpersonal relationship? How many of you here have that one person that's the only person that you would trust to go to? Is that person in your building? Any tech support people in this room? Okay, good, we can talk to you. <laughs> that's one of the challenges that I have in my job and the, the teachers that I teach my students is that tech support is never supportive. You know, tech support, it's that we make tech seem like it's, I didn't offend people over there, did I? No. It's, that's the challenge is that we make, t we make technology seem like this, this foreign language, you know, and it's another discourse system and you're not part of this discourse system when that's not fair. Okay, we need to make technology approachable. Um, just use it, don't be afraid, participate. Join a Twitter chat? What? We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, don't do it all at once. Ask students to show me how. Great, great statement. You know, I mean, it's back when I was teaching, I would, uh, the, the one student that was challenging uh, to me, that was like my teacher's pet. Like, he or she would always help me out, and they would help put things away, they help set out, you know, put papers out for students, turn out stuff. But then when we started to use technology, that one student would help and be the class leader. Um, and some of my partners in crime that you already know, uh, Julie Coiro, Joe Castig, Lori Henry, and others, I mean, if you look at the research we did with the Tika work and then uh, the work with Clemson, basically, we'd identify those students that were experts in certain things. Like, you wanna know how to copy paste? All right, Jose knows how to copy paste. Go talk to Jose when you want to copy paste. You want to use Photoshop. You know, Mara Cruz knows how to use Photoshop. Go talk to her. Don't bother me, because I don't know how to do it. Uh, but there is an opportunity to share the wealth. Um, when we talk about others that use technology and mentors and, you know, finding somebody that will help us, where are those people in this room? Right next to me. Raise your hand if, if you consider yourself to be a mentor and you want to help other people out. Okay. Just in general. <laughs> yeah. All right, let me rephrase that. If you want to help with technology, if you want to help just in general problems, all the life coaches, please raise your hand. <laughs> yes. Um, how are we going to get in touch after we all leave? I mean, it's good if we're all here in the same room. It's good if we, I mean, that's a big challenge that you need to figure out as an organization. If we're here in the same room, it's okay to go and say, Julie, I need this help. I don't understand what he was talking about with Evernote or whatever. And then we can get in touch. You always have me. I, when I walk out the building, I don't miraculously disappear. That's not how I operate. Email me. I always get emails and phone calls. It's hate mail, love mail, it's all the same. But basically, hey, I need more info. It's already on my blog as well. But how are you going to keep in touch and connect and collaborate and support one another? It's a big challenge, something you gotta figure out as an organization. There is a way to do it. Um, yeah, time. Where do you have the time to play? Um, effing, what? Um, <laughs> it's a different talk. Um, good job, squirrel. <laughs> Way to go, squirrel. Just typing. Yeah, exactly. All of a sudden, the tide turned. Um, so, the other thing, YouTube tutorials. Um, so, play is incredibly important. The other thing that we talked a little bit about earlier is the, the F word that we won't, don't want to hear in our classrooms, and it's not what squirrel put up there, which is fail. Some of this is there's fi finding out what doesn't work for you. 
And that's okay. That's the, the world that we're going into is it's fail faster. It's learn how to iterate. Learn from your mistakes and move on. And at some point in education, we all of a sudden got this idea that failure was a bad thing. But for most people, that's how we learn. Um, graduate courses, yeah. And I work at an institution of higher ed, sorry for those of you that also work there uh, at an institution of higher ed. A lot of the, I've been talking about this six year program, the instructional tech program. All of my materials for my classes are on my blog and all my syllabi. So if you wanna go put yourself to sleep at night, you can read my syllabi. Um, YouTube tu tutorials, that's how I learn. I learn through YouTube, okay? I am proud that I replaced the water heater, the hot water heater in my house using YouTube, okay, I swear. Um, also technology, I have teachers that come up to me and say, well, how do I use this tool, that tool, that tool? I go on YouTube. Because there's going to be some 12-year-old kid from Peoria, Illinois, that, that's going to give you like this backwards and forwards tutorial on how to use the tool that you want. It's always there. How many people here use Moodle? Yeah. I mean, it, it, there's, there's tutorials for everything online. And it's all little kids. I'm learning how to use Minecraft right now. Because I want to learn how to play Minecraft with my son. What is it? Stamby Cat? Stamby Cat. Stamby Cat? Is it a YouTube channel? Stamby, yes. Really? My son is in Minecraft crazy, he's crazy. Stamby Cat. Is this appropriate? He's, yeah, that's appropriate. Are you the squirrel? No, I'm not the squirrel. Um, <laughs> so. What was the other one, the Stampy Long News or whatever? Um, he is a British young man who has made a fortune in the side of He's well, made a fortune doing these, these Minecraft tutorials for kids. Well, that's the thing is, one of the teachers in my program, we were talking about this one day, and she said, my son. Her son uh, is in eighth grade, and the, the teachers in his building could basically care less about you know, he comes into class, he doesn't really fit into the normal buckets that we have in our classroom. The teachers said, and this is a, the mother telling me, like, what do I do for my son? And just not supportive at all. And so I start talking about Minecraft and she's like, oh, my son's got a channel on YouTube. I did, a, I did an LRA show the other day on gaming. He came on and sat with the experts. You can see him, his name's Garth. Okay, I asked him, I said, how do I use Minecraft? I wanna get my son involved. He put together two uh, YouTube tutorials to teach a three-year-old how to play Minecraft. My three-year-old. And I'm like, you're in a different league. And so that's what I've been saying to him. I said, Garth, you're gonna make a trillion dollars. What's his channel? Garmar 2000? <laughs> yeah, that's the thing is that this is, and they have all these different environments. We have Twitch now where people go on and watch others game. Um, so how do we do all this? Here's a, a couple, here, here's what I strive for. And this is the part of the night where people go, well, that guy's just a tech geek. You know, we don't want to do what he's got to do. So what I want you to do is I want you to look at what I'm talking about and think about it and be critical and figure out what works for you and what doesn't work for you. We need to think individually. We also need to think collectively as an organization because that's why we're all here. Um, so I have a couple different things that I try to focus for. Number one is I want a device agnostic policy that has ubiquitous access to data, okay? Because I use many devices. And I'll tell you the truth, and most people, especially this audience, will probably hate me, most of my readings on this, okay? Most of my reading is on this thing right here. This is my primary way that I communicate, socialize, read, connect, collaborate, this device. And if you paid attention to the Apple conference two, three weeks ago, if you paid attention to the Google conference a couple days ago, this is the future. Everything's gonna run through mobile, okay? It's all just screens. So most of my stuff is here, um, but the trick is, the, the organizations don't want us to be on multiple devices. If you're an iPhone, Apple person, 
Apple wants you in their ecosystem. Android, Google, they want you in their ecosystem. Windows trying to figure out what they want to do. Um, but that's the challenge, is that I, I'm on everything. In my bag, I have a Chromebook, I got an iPad, I have a Nexus 7, I have this phone, home I got a PC, and at work I had this MacBook Pro. I have to go to all different devices at all different times. So I need to be able to do that. I need ubiquitous access to data. My data's got to be everywhere. So there's no the dog ate my homework mentality. Okay, those of you that are Google Apps for Educators, where are your hands again? You know, or if you use Office 360, the nice thing is that, you know, the internet can't eat your homework. You know, if we use it correctly, the data is there. Um, I need to be able to access it anywhere. This thing, this MacBook Pro, I don't want to say it now because then the hard drive will die, but I've gone through tons of hard drives. You know, I've, it's died plenty of times. Things happen, data gets lost. I can't have things get lost. So how do I do this? My instructional tech program is BYOB. I found out quickly that uh, I had to explain what BYOB meant. Because <laughs> okay, I had a lot of teachers sign up for the program and they got in for uh, false advertising. Yeah. My world is BYOB, that's bring your own browser. Okay? Bring your own browser. In, in our program, there's no textbooks. We build the text as a class. Everything exists in Google Apps, in Google Sites, Google Docs, the wiki spaces. How many people use wiki spaces here? Yeah, wiki spaces is great. And I learned about wiki spaces by talking to a bunch of language arts teachers. You know, I walked into a conference five, six years ago, um, Mass State Reading Association. I was like, here I am, Mr. Tech Guy. And the teacher said, hey, use wiki spaces. Started right after that. Um, bring your own browser. I said, if you can get to a browser, if you can get to a webcam and a browser, you can get to all the materials you need. You gotta come in with your own browser. I use Chrome. Um, I think you know a lot of people also use Firefox. I prefer Chrome, both great choices. If you use Safari or Internet Explorer, I have to ask why. Um, but basically, it's all BYOB, it's bring your own browser. And I think that that's the best environment for our students as well. I'm also big on open. There's a lot of questions about open. Um, some of the questions revolve around, are we allowed to be open? In higher ed, this is a battle. There's a battlefield brewing and I want to be right in the middle of that. Um, there's questions about being open and online. You know, there's that uh, New York Times, Nick Kristoff piece about we need more public academics. And then we have a lot of other people that are saying, okay, you gotta be published, it's gotta be locked down, you have to uh, just serve the university, people gotta pay for your product. Um, my university, thankfully, uh, they're not looking yet, they'll probably review this later, you know, and say, hey, we wanna brand that, we want, you know, did you charge, charge, charge. I want my stuff open, look at my blog, everything's open. Um, I have had colleagues of mine come back and say, why do you share everything openly on your blog? You know, you should be monetizing that. The reason why I want to be open is because it fuels the future of teaching and learning. Okay? Blended learning. How many people here want to flip the classroom? Just one? Two? It's okay. We can all just be loud and proud. But flipping the classroom, but this is what we do. I mean, this is what the future classroom will probably look like. We have collaboration, we have active learning, synchronous, asynchronous teaching and learning. We have different peer-student collaborations. Um, but in order to make this whole environment happen, in order to make the flipping the classroom model happen, in order to make hybrid learning happen, we have to have materials online for kids to go to and use. Okay, so we gotta be open, we gotta share. That's one of the, the main reasons I do it. Also personal learning networks. How many people here are in PLNs, personal learning networks? PLCs. PLCs. You know, those of us that get online, we get in Twitter chats, we, we communicate with others, we collaborate with others, we learn from others. How do I do this? I blog. I blog a lot. I also do a couple other things. I put the links there. The links are also, you have access to the PowerPoint. 
The links are also in the back channel. Um, but basically, I blog a lot. And I've started to do um, these shows. So I started to put together these shows where it started with my blog, I would have big questions. And I'd want to bring on a panel of experts to talk about the, the issues. So we're talking about like writing and uh, technology or multimodal uh, text and tools. Then we started doing these Literacy Research Association research to practice episodes. So we bring on experts. Uh, the last one that we had was on gaming. We had one in a couple weeks on critical race theory. But I think it's an opportunity to bring in scholars and talk to teachers about what this research means. Um, the last thing I have coming up is, I mentioned earlier I'm the uh, multi-literacies department editor, the department editor for multi-literacies production and consumption. Thank you. Um, for JAL. And so as part of that, I'm working with the editors at JAL and I said, okay, I owe you four columns, but what I'd like to do is I'd like to put together some online content, free. Some online content, you know, video form and YouTube videos, put it out for free. Because not everybody pays for JAL, not everybody pays for these publications. Um, so you should, I put my column, the first column that's coming out, I put the column out there so you can read it. Um, but then also you should see video coming out soon and I'll put it up on the blog, but that's, I'm trying to push more of that openly online. Because I think that there's opportunities that we miss if we're not openly online. The last one is digital identity. I have hesitations about talking about this, given the, the recent <laughs> privacy leaks, given all the stuff we know um, that, that Edward Snowden told us about. Um, I think that there's issues uh, with digital identity and privacy of information for you, but also your students. But that's another talk for another day. Um, the, the main argument that I try to make is that I think that you should create and curate an online brand or a digital identity. I think that when we start our school year, we you know have our classrooms set up beautifully. It's immaculate. Some of us have everything built that first day, and some of us build the classroom over the year. I was the one that I had my, my classroom was like halfway built when students enter, and then over the course of the year, I put up their work and you know populate it with their stuff. Um, but we have our classroom and everything is immaculate. And then also our um, you know offline identity. You know we have like our first day of school outfit. You know and you had those new shoes that you got from DSW. You know or you had like your perfect outfit. But then the challenge is that online. We look a little shabby. And that's a challenge. Okay, that's a problem. We need to really cultivate and curate our digital identity, our online brand. Because increasingly, we Google, not increasingly, we Google each other. We stalk each other online. You know, I mean, a couple people came up, like, I read everything that you put up online. Okay, we check each other out online. Okay, and that's not a bad thing. Um, I, I was speaking to principals recently in Connecticut, and I said, um, you know, back when I was teaching, if an administrator found out that you had a Facebook account, you know, you'd get fired. You'd, you'd have to hide it or get fired, you know? And the principal said, well, that's kind of funny because now before we have a potential teacher come in to get a job, we Google you, and we're more apprehensive if you have nothing. If you don't have a digital identity at all, we're more likely not to hire you or bring you in because we feel like you're disconnected from the kids, okay? Please keep in mind that's not all schools, okay? That's, that's not all places. But we're going through, we're in between two models here. We're going through this shift, and I think we owe it to ourselves to work on our online brand, and you can change your digital footprint, and you can change your student's digital footprint. Seth Godin's piece here, we're talking about a long tail, okay? Right now, there are lawsuits happening in the Europe, in the EU, and also in Canada, where people want to be able to erase stuff from the internet. Okay, so when your your house was foreclosed, or you were caught in that hotel with whatever, um, you want to be able to erase that from the internet. For those of us that know how the internet works, it doesn't really work that way. Um, but 
what Seth Godin says is, is absolutely true. What you want to do is you want to overload. You know, you want obscurity uh, through all of that data that you put in. Okay, so if you, you start putting more and more content online, then when Google indexes it, when people search for you, they're not gonna find those pictures of you doing keg stands or whatever it was that you were doing. They're gonna find your blog and your posts about Evernote and all this new stuff that you put up there. Okay, so you're looking at trying to build that long tail of, of good stuff, and it's possible, okay? So the, the issue is you have to start building up more and build up that digital footprint and open public scholarship. So, I mean, one of the things, if, if we look back through, how many people here are very active on Twitter? It's okay, you can raise your hand, we won't judge you. Yeah, four or five of us. Yeah, I mean, it's, that, I mean, some of us use Twitter, how many people are very active on Facebook? LinkedIn? You know, I mean, these are, it, the, the scholarship, the sharing stuff online, this also adds to that digital footprint. This helps build your digital identity. How do I do this? Uh, two things I wanted to share. One is, where's my friend in the Connected Learning MOOC? How many people know what the Connected Learning MOOC is? Yeah. A uh, National Writing Project right now is the second week. I put links up there. One of the best professional development ac activities that you can get involved in, it's super fun, is the Connected Learning MOOC. Basically, uh, what they do is they give you weekly projects. They're called makes. And you go online, and there's a huge community online where they basically push you to try different things. So the first make of this year was they wanted you to make like a, a one page about yourself. It's basically like a recipe for yourself. So in order to make Ian, I would need different parts of stuff to get to put that together. Um, the second week is this week. It's uh, all about memes, M-E-M-E's, and that's like an online joke. So they're talking about building those and constructing those. So it's a great professional development activity. You can go online and get involved and, and make things online and expand your horizons and build your digital identity. Or you can just lurk and see what are these people doing, which is, yeah, I mean, lurking is a way for us to learn. The other thing I want to talk about is the Walk My World project. Uh, a bunch of us got together and we had a crazy idea. This was originally uh, an NCTE project that we would research. Most of the students that we all work with could care less about poetry. Now I know that the students that you work with love poetry, <laughs> they love to read, write, respond to poetry. Strangely, these students did not. So we tried to figure out how can we get kids involved in poetry. And what we started to have them do was we wanted them to, once a week for 10 weeks, share a look into their world. And we had students from different parts of the globe, different populations, and we wanted them to connect and share online using Twitter. So what we said is, 10 weeks, once a week, we want you to share a picture or a video from your world. You can use Instagram. You can use Vine. Vine is a lot of fun, by the way. You can use Instagram, you can use Vine, you can just send a picture, you can send an audio clip. We want you to give us a snapshot of your world and just put it on Twitter with the Walk My World hashtag. So all of a sudden we had you know, students from elementary schools sharing. Um, I give you the link to not only my blog posts about it, but I also give you the link to the piece we're putting together for uh, the MIT Civic Media Reader. Is that what it's called? Um, Julie was on it with us. There's a bunch of researchers. We all got together. And it was a fun social media uh, activity, a learning activity, where we had basically students sharing on Twitter. And we shared on Twitter as well. So it was a lot of fun figuring out how to use these different tools and share and learn and recreate our digital identity. So we still have questions, okay? A couple big questions that hopefully are in the back of your heads. And the nice thing about this is that this is not the end of the dialogue. We'll have Q&A sessions coming up. 
right after this, also tomorrow. Please keep in touch. There's bigger questions that we have though. Number one, what about ownership and copyright and IP intellectual property stuff you put online? Okay. So if I, let's say I wrote the, the, the greatest blog post on the face of the planet, it ain't gonna happen. Um, and I put it out there and all of a sudden, like who owns it? Who owns stuff that you put online? Okay. Um, my own belief set is that there's no real ownership anymore. You know, I put so much online and I remix stuff online and I share stuff online that I don't really own it anymore. You know, I have some ideas, but I bounce my ideas off somebody else. Acceptable use policy. Is your building's acceptable use policy acceptable or not? Are you allowed to do this stuff? Most of us aren't. You know, are your students allowed to do this? If you're in an elementary population, terms of service is usually 13 years of age. You can't do this stuff, okay? Um, also, there's issues of privacy and identity and social spaces. You know, we know gigs up. We know that our government and we know that businesses are stealing data on us, okay? We know that this is true. That's very problematic um, and we need to figure out what does this mean for our society. Also, issues of access. How many people here have access issues in your building with technology? The kids just don't have the tools. They're like, hey, we'd love to do this stuff you're talking about, but it ain't gonna happen. Um, and then maintaining and hosting your own data. Not using Google, not using uh, Edmodo, not using Dropbox, but using other tools. You can use, set up your own Moodle server. But we'll end on a positive note. So, where do we start here? Number one, back up your computers. Okay, please back up. It's not a question of if you'll lose your data, but when. Okay, if you decide Google Apps is for you, and I had a colleague last week, I gave him his Chromebook, I said you're teaching in my program, use Google Drive, use Google Box, don't use Blackboard for God's sake. Um, and so he started using it, and then basically went to his whole hard drive trying to sync stuff with Google Drive. Back up your computers. Number two, we gotta figure out, and we said this earlier, how do we follow and lead here in the organization? Did I spell it the right way that time? Um, but also your other online personal learning networks, and I'm there for you. Uh, third, we're looking for flexible, persistent learners. All of us have something to add here. And this is all what we talked about earlier with the tools you just have to play. Uh, the fourth one is what I want to highlight is uh, my advisor basically said, you know, there's a whole ocean out there, it matters where you want to dip your bucket. You have to figure out what works for you. You have to figure out which one of these tools and other tools out there work for you. What makes sense for you in your classroom with your students? Okay, not everything will fit. And there's also other tools that we haven't even started to talk about yet that would be of use. And then I think, do we have any other probing questions? Very cool. We have like three minutes left. What other questions? Yeah.
you hit on a lot of different things. I mean, the, the issue of cost is very broad because different organizations are starting to move to that model. Like Adobe and all the Illustrator programs and stuff are moving to this subscription based, not a one time. Um, the other issue with cost is stuff that's free, but you're always paying. So how are you paying? With Google Apps and Google Box, you're paying with your, your info. Um, My advice would be, number one, I would ask that you blog and write and share openly about the challenges and the decisions that you're making, because I know that there's other people that are having the same challenges, especially the plagiarism part. If you have a plagiarism policy, please share it, you know, because I know there's a lot of people that have that issue. The other thing is you connect online with like the personal learning network, and you connect online here and say, what's the best because that guy right there will have input on like what's the best and so why um, but it's not the best for everybody for every situation and this guy's closing in to close you down yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, wasn't that wonderful I mean, I, 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 <laughs> Um, in about 15 minutes, the breakouts, the technology breakout sessions begin. They're all on the second floor. There are some snacks outside in the hall here. There are also snacks available in the second floor break area. We have breakout rooms. Um, so please uh, decide which area. If you haven't been able to access the Leadership Workshop uh, website, find somebody who has and find out what room you uh, need to go to next. Thank you. Mine here. I have to look that up myself. <laughs> <laughs>